Welcome back. Well, early adopters of the Parrot Report will, record, will recall that on one of our first programs we featured a fascinating interview with expat Aussie tycoon Richard Farley in London. The former BT wonder kid, hedge fund success and major tech sector investor is currently in Australia and took the time to drop in for a chat. Welcome Richard. Hey Janine, how are you doing? Nice to have you in the studio instead of all those technical problems we had that time <laughs> in London. Now, you're down here for a trip in the outback with your family. Now, last time I introduced you, you've got an interesting family background. Give us just a potted well, history I've of your background. Uh, I've introduced a new bit of vocabulary to England, whoop whoop. I've been telling everyone I'm going to whoop whoop, so I think it's going into the dictionary over there. But uh, now I'm heading off with, I'm one of 11 kids, and there's eight of us left, and seven of us are heading off into the middle of Queensland, into the outback. And uh, we've got a bit, there's a bit of a treasure map, but that's another story, so we might have a bit of a detour and look for a bit of treasure. But it's a family bonding session, because we all grew up separately in uh, foster homes, so it's a chance for us to sort of spend a long time together and have a bit of a laugh and a giggle in the car. Yeah, because it is one of the interesting things about you. I mean, you were all fostered out. I think you were only two or three when you, you know, this big family. Your father was a shearer, itinerant worker. I mean, I don't think, I think you told me once you hadn't even slept in a bed in your first few years. Yeah, well, you know, I, I mean, I do have a rule, though, that the more people bang on about how tough their childhood was, you know, the less true it is. So I generally don't like to talk too much about it. But, it, you know, it was, we were living in a, in a tent and, and travelling around and he was an itinerant worker and alcoholic so well instead of concentrating on how bad it is nice happy ending that the, the remaining kids have got together i mean is this the first time all eight of you have gone off on holiday yeah yeah it is it's the first time and for a long time too and it's a good i mean i guess being in a car we'll find out if we're still speaking when we come back <laughs> but uh five or six hours a day in the car it's got to be good doesn't it get to know someone that way but you know we're, but the funny thing is you know that nurture versus nature argument even we all grew up separately and uh you know we've got to know each other over the years but we're all very similar which is funny so which is a big argument for nature not so much the way we're brought up but we all, we all have the, we all laugh at the same things and do the same silly things so it'll be good fun and why did you pick the outback i didn't it sort of picked us <laughs> because uh my parent my, the, the 11th of the children of us was uh, actually given away by my parents to a family up it well he was given away to a family up in queensland so he lives in the middle of there so we're going off to that spot which i don't even know what it's called to find him so um, you know, it really is a kind of an Aussie story, isn't it? At least it makes more sense here than it does back in the UK. It certainly does. Now, I, do you want to tell us about the treasure map? Because there is a bit of a story well, on that. Well, my isn't father it? gave me a map uh, which, uh, to bauxite, which is a mineral used to make uh, aluminium. So uh, it used to be worth nothing, but now, you know, like all the minerals, it's worth a lot. And uh, he, just, he just found it while he was digging around. And uh, I always think it was Lang Hancock who was flying over and he saw the red soil and he found all the, all the uh, iron and... and uh, you know, he became rich, so you know, we're going to take a bit of a detour and try to find... But the name of the place is like Dead Man's Creek or something. <laughs> but he just gave me this map and he said, take an assay, so we'll take an assay and then we'll go and see if there's any books out like there. Sounds like either a plot for a telly movie or else you're thinking a reality series now, you know? Oh, well, I'm wondering if we're going to be filmed somewhere, but, uh, you know, what happened... But they, all, my, all my brothers and sisters want a copy of the map and I haven't given them a copy yet, so uh, if I'm found dead, please mark this point <laughs> right now that uh, they haven't got the map yet. Just on the nature versus nurture argument, um, you... You, you're an interesting story in yourself that when you went to school you didn't do very well at the start. They thought you were a bit backward, I guess was the word they used then. You discovered chess and actually found that you were very good at numbers and, and went on to have a very successful financial career. Have, uh, has anyone else in the family shown that aptitude for numbers or chess or anything like no, that? No, well not chess so much, but, but you know, the, my brother Rodney, who may be, hey Rodney, but he may be, uh, you know, he, he, he was really a success story because, you know, back in the 60s they didn't do much for foster children, like it's completely different now, but uh, you know, he ran away a few times trying to get back to our mother and father and he had a terrible start in life, three or four foster homes, never finished school, worked at a railway, started working at Melbourne Railways as a cleaner. By the time he retired, you know, 35 years later, a few years ago, he was running six of the major stations. So he just worked his way up from nothing. And he's got two ch lovely children who are both, both doing PhDs in, in Melbourne universities. So it's a nice story. So obviously, hopefully, you know, he's got a bit of an house in there somewhere, isn't he? And I also think of you in the sense that you were written off in an early stage and then you got a good teacher and, and you know, your potential was realised. We've got a big debate on education here and, in fact, overseas it's becoming an issue about public schools and private schools. I'm just wondering from your experience what was the lesson, and you've got children yourself now, on, on the fact that somebody can be really smart but be overlooked within a school system. I mean, you were lucky. Chess was, I think, your answer to getting out and showing you had this um, potential for numbers there. 
Yeah, well, it's difficult. You know, in the UK, I don't know what, so much what it's like here, but in the UK, they're really tough. You know, I've got, you know, I've got seven and eight-year-old children, and, and they're learning what the capital of Nepal is, you know, or the capital of Kenya is, but they don't know what a country is. You know, they're filling their brains with these facts. At seven or eight, they've got to sit and study this stuff. And I'm like, who's successful these days? It's not people who know the capital of Kenya, you know, particularly. It's people with imagination. It's people who can think outside the box. And they want to do that. They want to run around and pretend they're dinosaurs, and I'm making them sit down and learn the capital of Kenya, and they don't even know what Kenya is. So I'm really in favour of people sort of learning to imagine things and having personality, because I was very shy as a kid and, and I've learned <laughs> I've learned <laughs> I'm a bit nervous but now I've learned the value of getting on with people and people skills and imagination and all that. and I, they are the things that I see that you know successful people all over the world have not Do so much well, education given that you're living in the UK and I know you have a connection with with Oxford and some institutions in your investing um, what do you see is lacking in the education system because I know you talk to people about um, entrepreneurs you do conferences on what they need to do but I mean obviously sometimes it's a bit late if they're you know 20s or 30s and they want money if they haven't got those skills you said what more could we be doing to train them into it to become a, a culture of entrepreneurs maybe in this country well you know I think it's hard I think you have to make sure the teachers are happy you know because I was lucky because I didn't have a, any father figure you know and and uh, you know but I had teachers who took me under their wing you know a couple of them in succession and, and they went that extra mile and I think that makes a huge difference now how do you help teachers to do that you know do you pay them better do you give them nice conditions to work in but teachers I think you know are amazing and they make a huge difference and we all remember our good teachers and our bad teachers and it's the good teachers that I remember that really helped me and it's not so much what you learn but it's how they teach it to you and the encouragement they give you when you mess up and when you do well you know so it's, it's, it's human side but you know that's the hard thing to extract out and of education. And that's the same all over the world that's it not is, unique it is. to Australia. But as I say I am anti the rote learning uh, you know, and, and, and you know anything that can encourage imagination and, and you know character building, all that sort of stuff. Well, that's early education. What about when you're getting into the tertiary level here? You invest a lot in in well, you invest only in UK new tech, new companies. There, you're not really an investor in Australia in that sense. No, What's no. the attraction? Why the UK over say Australia? Well, I live there, though, so that's... <laughs> um, but, you know, I ended up there because I was running a fund in, in Bermuda. I ended up living in Monaco because it's a sunny place, you know. I mean, but, uh, ended so up is living... Australia right here in place? Yeah, not, not at the moment. I'll tell you, I've flown halfway across the world. But, uh, no, mainly because I was there. But also, it's, it's nicely in the middle. When I started to invest in, in technology out of, out of universities, it was nicely in the middle. It's a bigger market than Australia, obviously, and it's a lot smaller than the US. But the value of intellectual property coming out of universities was very undervalued, in my opinion, compared to what was coming out of... American universities and, and probably here and, and when I started doing it sort of 10 years ago you could you could buy ideas that had been in a university and you could invest for a valuation of hundred thousand pounds or something so it, it's it's the low valuations you know you can you, something that you might have had 10 PhD students working on for 10 years a cure for cancer you know something like that is not very expensive to invest in so I was interested in that sort of arbitrage well I guess the more you talk about it the more likely they are to catch on to it does that mean it's harder now to get that no, competitive you know, I mean, advantage you know, I mean I, you know I've been talking to people in the UK about a TV show there to really highlight, you know, because the, because the Brits are a bit down on themselves. You know, when you know Tim Henman didn't used to win Wimbledon, like they they just Tommy always, Winters. yeah, but they're down <laughs> on themselves as much as they are on us. You know, but uh, you know, I was trying to sort of showcase what they do have, and and there is so much intellectual property in universities, and I'm sure it's the same here. That uh, it doesn't matter how many people you tell, you know. But but I will say I had I was getting a hard time from a professor the other day because we hadn't managed to commercialise his intellectual property particularly well but you know we're doing a reasonable job but it takes a long time but it's the brilliance that goes into commercializing an idea is pretty well equal to the brilliance to make it so you could come up with a fantastic new invention but to get it on the shelves and to get people buying it it's a long process and it takes a lot of effort and a lot of in ingenuity to get it there